Happy New Year and welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now you will hear Pastor Rich preach the sermon, A Grave Injustice, from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 43 through 52. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now to Pastor Rich. So here in America, we have certain rights and laws pertaining to false arrest. I read an article about false arrest on a legal encyclopedia website, and it asked the question, so is false arrest a crime? In many states, false arrest or false imprisonment are crimes. An unlawful arrest case, however, usually ends up being a civil lawsuit that asks for remedies of damages. In most false arrest cases, a successful plaintiff can collect two kinds of damages. They can collect special damages and general damages. You know, in Jesus's time, if you were a Roman citizen, you had a lot of rights. But non-citizens within the Roman Empire, especially Jewish people, did not enjoy the same rights or freedoms as Roman citizens. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, as we jump back into that line-by-line study. Really quickly, as you're turning there, let's just catch up from last week. Last week, we learned how the Passover dinner was over, and Jesus and his disciples make their way to the Mount of Olives. Jesus wanted to go to a secluded place and he instructed his disciples to go sit and pray as they waited for him. Then remember, Jesus took his inner circle of followers to pray and showed them a place to pray. And this is kind of the practical from last week that not only is prayer important, but reliance upon the Lord is just as important. So Jesus leaves behind his closest followers And he goes to pray and three times while he's praying, three full times, he goes back and each time finds his closest friends, his closest followers sleeping while he's in agony. Gethsemane, we learned, was a garden outside the city across the Kidron Brook on the Mount of Olives. Remember what the name Gethsemane meant. Gethsemane meant olive press. It's the very place that Jesus was pressed that we might receive the olive oil. Remember, we learned that he sweat great drops of blood, as it were, when he was in agony and anxious about what was going to happen to him. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath on the cross at Calvary, but the burden was felt there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so today's passage, we're going to see the final betrayal of Judas, his betrayer while Jesus is still in the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, the false arrest, the false arrest. If your Bibles are open, Mark chapter 14, let's begin with verse 43. Notice the timeline. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, with a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him, Jesus, and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. We ended last time with a very important lesson for all of us. That as Jesus prayed to the Father, let this cup pass before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will, that God actually did not give him what he prayed for. Instead, God the Father gave him the strength to endure what must take place. And then once Jesus received that strength from the Father, he was ready to face the hour that was at hand. Now comes the garden scene. Now he's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then the cross. There in your notes, the agony of Gethsemane was now behind Jesus, but the reality and brutality of his arrest, false trials, beatings, and the cross were about to take place. Notice the verse again, where we left off last week. Jesus said, my betrayer is at hand. And then today begins with, and immediately, while he was still talking, Judas 
comes with these people from the chief priest. In that day, the religious leaders were made up of three separate parties and they were called the Sanhedrin as a group. Notice who these people are and notice what their ministry responsibility is. This is important. First, you had the chief priest who were supposed to lead the nation in worship of God. Then you had the scribes who were the biblical scholars of the day. These are the ones who know all the prophecies of Messiah. These are the ones that know scripture, studied scripture their whole entire lives. So you have the worship leaders, you have the biblical scholars, and then finally you have the elders who were charged with the spiritual welfare of the nation. Think, think about their job descriptions here. You have a worship leader, scholars, and then the ones who were supposed to watch over the spiritual welfare of the nation. The arrest of Jesus, the one true Messiah and King of Israel, was actually ordered by those who were supposed to be watching out over their spiritual maturity and their spiritual welfare. In the same narrative in the Gospel of John, if you go and read it, we find out that this great multitude that came with Judas was actually a battalion of troops. Now, this is important to remember. A battalion of troops was about 600 men. And we're not told whether these were temple guards or Roman soldiers. But some believe because Jerusalem is under Roman rule at this time that they didn't have their own soldiers because they weren't allowed to. So they believe that the religious leaders actually went to the Romans and asked for men to go with them to arrest Jesus from the Antonio Fortress. There in your notes, Judas brought a massive group of armed soldiers and temple police to falsely arrest Jesus at night. Now, this is important because you're going to see how illegal and how wrong this whole deal was. They came to arrest Jesus at night. Again, when we're studying the garden scene in the Gospel of John, this is one of those aha moments. John 18, 4 says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, keep this question in the back of your mind, whom are you seeking? Verse five, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, listen to these words, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood there with him. There in your notes, verse six, now, when he said to them, I am he, catch what happened. They drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus in John 18, six here attributes the name of God, the great I am to himself. Whom are you seeking? Jesus. And he said, I am. I am. If you remember the story, this is the same name when Moses went to the burning bush, and God told Moses, go and tell my children to follow you, and I'm going to set them free. And Moses said, but God, when they ask me, what's your name of the person who said, go to the children of Israel, God told them there in the burning bush, I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent you. And so here's Jesus saying, I am the same God. That was at the burning bush. I'm the one who spoke to Moses in the desert. In the Greek, the word is ego eimi. And what it means is Jesus is the self-existent God. He wasn't created at some time in history. He has always existed and he existed because of himself. And Jesus right here very clearly claims, I am the great I am. In the present tense, again, Jesus was saying, I was never created. I've always been the same God. And so as Jesus tells them, I'm the same God that Moses met at the burning bush, Jesus reveals just a little bit of his Shekinah glory to this mob that came to arrest him. Now, I want you to picture what's going on here. I've often said that Jesus kind of opens his shirt and shows this big S on his chest, right? Whom are you seeking? Jesus. And he said, I am. And 600 of them go, whoo, and fall backwards to the ground. 
Shekinah glory is the English transliteration of a Hebrew word meaning dwelling or settling, which symbolizes God's presence right there and then. There in your notes, Jesus' is Shekinah glory is seen in the tabernacle in Exodus, and it's the same glory Jesus revealed to his closest followers on the Mount of Transfiguration. So Jesus asked those who came to arrest him, whom are you seeking? They say, Jesus. And so he reveals just a touch of his true identity to them. Picture what's going on here. I mean, this is incredible. Who are you seeking? Oh, we're seeking Jesus. And he says, well, here's who Jesus is. Can you handle it? And as Jesus reveals just a touch of his Shekinah glory to this mob, they're overwhelmed. And I want you to notice something because there's a lesson here for us. In John 18, 6, it says they fell backwards to the ground. Now, when you're watching TV or you go to one of these churches and something happens, I'm not trying to pick on anyone, but all through scripture, when a friend of Jesus is overwhelmed by Jesus, they fall forward and worship the Lord. When an enemy is overwhelmed by Jesus, they fall backwards. So just keep that in mind. But it's ironic here that Judas has to go and identify Jesus with a kiss. Not a handshake, not a hug, but a kiss. And why is that? Well, this time of history in the Middle East, a kiss was the common greeting of the day. Now today, we've all heard the idiom, right? The kiss of death. They've made a song about it. They've made a movie about it. And, and the kiss of death, I think of the Godfather, right? Fredo, right? <laughs> How could you, Fredo, sort of thing. Not that I've ever seen the movie. <laughs> but the kiss of death is supposed to mark that if you get that kiss, you are marked for death. Listen to what Solomon said in the book of Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Judas had to identify Jesus. And, and you might go, why? I mean, Jesus was all over the place. He was everywhere. He was teaching every day in the temple and the synagogues. And why didn't this 600 person mob know who Jesus was? Well, it seems that Jesus was just kind of ordinary looking. He wasn't like extraordinary looking as a person. The prophet Isaiah foretelling the Messiah in the New Living Translation of Isaiah 53, 2 says this. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, sprouting from a root and dry and sterile ground. There was nothing catch this beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing that would attract us to him. And so after the kiss of betrayal, the mob lays their hands on Jesus and next, Roman numeral two, we're going to see a miracle during a betrayal. A miracle during a betrayal. Look at verse 47. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Again, I love reading the Gospel of John when it comes to the, this scene because we learn so much more. John 18.10 says this. Then Simon Peter, having a sword drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So the two players we get introduced to right out of the Gospel of John. The one who acts first, thinks later, Peter, is the one who drew his sword. And Malchus, this poor servant who was just doing what he was told to do, gets his ear handed to him. Remember what I said last week? It's kind of funny that this is the result. The moral of the story is you never trust a sword in the hand of a fisherman. You just don't. <laughs> but what's so ironic about this whole thing to me is that we're going to learn and we have learned already that Jesus knew everything that was about to happen to him. There's no mystery. The foreknowledge of almighty God living in Jesus Christ, he knew everything every jot and tittle. He knew the players. He knew what was going to happen. He knows everything. And yet on his way to the cross, after he sweat great drops of blood, he, he was anxious and overwhelmed to the point of death. He told us last week, while all that's going on and his focus is the cross, he goes to an enemy who came breaking the law to falsely arrest him 
and heals him. The mercy and healing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is overwhelming at this point. Even if I didn't know that, an enemy who was coming after me, I don't know that I'd want to give him the time of day, let alone knowing what was about to happen. And yet he stops and he heals him. It's ironic that he fixes the mess of one of his followers and he heals an enemy at the same time. Matthew 26, 52. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think, catch this, that I cannot now pray to my father. He will provide to me more than 12 legions of angels. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen? happen thus. I could pray to the father right now and he'll send down 12 legions of angels. Keep that in your mind. This is what Henry Ironside said, though. Suddenly, spurred on by intense emotions, one of them, who we now know as Peter, drew his sword and struck the high priest's servant and took off his ear. The moral of the story, Peter was asleep when he should have been praying and alert. Now, when he should be calm and trusting the Lord, he's excited and active. But both times was an act of the flesh, it wasn't an act of the spirit. There in your notes, Peter was foolish for attacking Malchus. And Jesus communicated to Peter that the battle in the garden was not a physical battle, but it was a necessary spiritual battle. Imagine. Peter, this must happen. May it never be, Lord. This must happen. The Apostle Paul telling the church at Corinth how we fight our battles said this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And catch this, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This battle is necessary. Now, some people, of course, say that this was Jesus forbidding swords or war or any of that, and they become pacifists. But that's not what this is at all. J.C. Ryle said the sword has, has its lawful place in protecting nations. But what I want to pay attention to is what Jesus told Peter. Peter, if I wanted to call down more than 12 legions of angels, I could do that right now. Now, the religious leaders bring a battalion of soldiers to arrest the king. A battalion, 600 men. Jesus said, I could call down 12 legions of angels. During this time, a Roman legion was between four and 6,000 soldiers. So I could call down 12 times 6,000 to fight my battle right now if I wanted to. Jesus used the example of legions because everyone was used to the Antonio fortress that was attached to the temple. And inside that fortress, you'd have these three to 600 soldiers. And their whole job was if Israel stopped being peaceful, they'd take the stairs down to the temple court and they'd wipe them out and make them, you know, start behaving themselves. So Jesus said, look, if I wanted to, I can call down between 48,000 and 72,000 angels. Now, some of us have this little pretty angel on our Christmas trees, right? Little red dress. And we think, well, 48,000 of those isn't that big of a deal. Let me give you a narrative of what an angel looks like from the Old Testament. And maybe this will mean a little more to you. At a second Kings 1935, it says, and it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people rose early in the morning, there were corpses and they were all dead. There in your notes, one angel in one night killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. What could 48,000 to 72,000 angels do to protect their creator? If one angel killed 185,000, now I didn't do the math on that, but 180,000, 70,000, that's a lot of dudes. Let me just tell you. Here's our takeaway. Our all-knowing, 
all-powerful, almighty creator God of the universe who knows full well what's about to take place stops in the middle of this, tells Peter, no, our battle's not physical. Let it happen. And he heals an enemy combatant in the middle of this. Roman numeral three, because the scriptures must be fulfilled. Look at verse 48. Then Jesus answered and said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then they all forsook him and fled. Jesus is basically saying, look, you could have arrested me without any fanfare, without anything else, any day of the week. You can find me any time in the temple and the synagogues teaching. There in your notes, this mob scene in the middle of the night was unnecessary. But even with this event, the word of God given through the prophets was being fulfilled. Now, you got to know this and we'll get into it in a minute. But everything they did that night was illegal. Everything they did that night was against their own law. And it just was completely wrong. And we'll get into that in a minute. But can I just tell you a secret? Had Jesus not submitted to these 600 men, there was no way in the world they could have ever arrested the king of kings. If he wanted to call down lightning, he could have made him dust right on the spot. Had he not submitted, they wouldn't have arrested him. But listen to what he says. It's got to happen. There's a lesson there for us. It's got to happen. Remember back last week, we said that, you know, when Jesus was in the garden, he went a little further. He fell on the ground and he said, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. There in your notes, Jesus allowed these atrocities to take place as he humbly submitted to the Father and showed his love to those for whom he was about to die. You know, over the next few hours, Jesus was going to be subjected to six illegal trials, then beatings, and then finally crucifixion, condemned to death. The religious leaders who prided themselves on keeping every jot and tittle of the law were breaking every law possible here in this scene. But before any of that could happen, notice all his followers forsook him. How did that make him feel? But Jesus was subjected to three illegal trials by the Jews. Catch this. One before Annas, one before Caphius, and finally before the Sanhedrin. Then there were three fake trials before the Gentiles. Pilate to Herod, back to Pilate. There were other laws broken as well. Let me just go over them really quickly, just in case you think it was just the trial. It was not. In their culture, and according to their law, a trial had to begin and end during the day. This is all at night, and first thing in the morning. There were no trials allowed during the Passover holiday, and yet that's exactly what this weekend was, was Passover. Here's another one. Only an acquittal could be reached the first day of a trial. If it was a guilty verdict, you had to wait two days and go over the evidence and the people making them guilty had to think about it. All evidence had to come from two or more witnesses. All false witnesses were put to death. That's a big deal. And all trials had to begin with proof of the person's innocence before they could give any proof of their guilt. And yet every one of those things did not happen to Jesus. The savior of the world didn't come covertly he was right there teaching them for all and they could have arrested him any time and done this right. But no, they weren't going to. Why? There in your notes. Because Jesus chose as part of the predetermined will of God to come and save lost sinners. Maybe you remember the story when Peter in Acts chapter four is given his testimony. This is what we learn in Acts 4, 27. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do, catch this, whatever your hand and your purpose 
predetermined before it to be done. No person on planet Earth is going to thwart God's ultimate will. No matter what, it's not going to happen. Jesus came from glory. He went back to glory. And someday he's coming in all his glory. But it was all part of a predetermined will of God the Father. Jesus in his high priestly prayer speaking to his father said this. Father, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory that I had before the world was. But woe to the people who played a part of his execution. Now there's kind of an interruption here that only is found in the Gospel of Mark. The other three Gospels don't include this. And I, hopefully I'll explain it to you. Roman numeral four, a young man fled. Look at verse 51. It says, now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. This is a different kind of thing, right? He has this linen cloth over him. The 600 guys grab hold of him. They grab hold of his linen cloth and he says, you can keep it. And he runs out of the garden naked. Again, only the Gospel of Mark talks about this. The words young man in the Septuagint, as well as the writing of Josephus, is a reference to strong, very strong men, valiant, faithful and wise men. This is what J.R. Edwards said about these two verses in Mark, that they're a reference to what the prophet Amos talked about. Amos 2.16 says, The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. J.R. Edwards says that the prophet Amos was talking about a trial that was going to come, a judgment that was so terrible that even the mightiest men on the face of the planet would run away naked at that judgment. Now, most commentators believe that John Mark is talking about himself in these verses as the young man fleeing the scene. Many of these commentators believe, according to Acts chapter 12, that John Mark's house is actually where the Passover supper happened. And so he had some sort of knowledge that Judas was going to betray him there in the garden. There in your notes. Those who believe the young man was Mark think he took it upon himself to run after Jesus and the disciples to warn the Lord. And then he also witnessed Jesus being arrested. So he fled. Listen to what Warren Wiersbe said about this. He asked the question, so was that John Mark? We really don't know. But since the Gospel of Mark's the only one of the four Gospels that records the event, the author could well have been talking about himself. The upper room was in the home of John Mark. So then perhaps Judas led the soldiers to his house first before going to the Garden of Gethsemane. There in your notes. John Mark may have hastily put on an outer garment and followed the mob to the garden. The soldiers may have even tried to arrest John Mark, so he fled. All the disciples leave. Our servant king is by himself Listen to what, again, the Gospel of John says about this. Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and leave me alone. And yet, I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. And so, as practical application, I'll go back to the statement that I said that Roman citizens during this time had so many rights. But non-citizens, and especially the Jews, did not enjoy the same rights and freedoms as Roman citizens. As a man and a citizen of Israel, there was nothing that Jesus could do to stop the false arrests, false trials, or conviction from these religious leaders as a man. But as Almighty God, Jesus could have called down 12 legions of angels and again, one angel, one night, 185,000 Assyrians were killed. What would 12 legions of angels do? Jesus said in John 12, 27, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this very purpose, I have come to this hour. 
It's easy to understand the struggle of Jesus in the garden when we realize what takes place at the cross. Second Corinthians 521, that great exchange, right? God, the father made Jesus who knew no sin to actually become sin for us. That in exchange, we become the righteousness of God in him. But more than becoming sin, Jesus also became a curse. The, the righteous, sinless son of God, God, the son, becoming sin, but also becoming a curse. This is what Paul said in Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It was not the physical suffering that overwhelmed our king. It wasn't the anguish and the sorrow, but it was the contemplation of what was about to take place. According to Hebrews 5, verses 7 through 9, Jesus asked to be saved Not from death, but out of death. And you'd go, what's the difference? Here's the difference. Jesus didn't ask to be saved from that hour. He asked to be raised from the dead. Jesus, in Hebrews, very clearly asked to be saved out of death, raised from the dead. And of course, we know the Father granted that request. So where I want to go for us practically this morning is this. And I often have trouble with this as well. But, you know, the book of Isaiah very clearly says that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are so far above our thoughts. And so we try to reason through every event that happens in our life. I should say I try to reason through every event that happens in my life. But I'm going to teach you two things you need to know the rest of your life. If you know these two things, you'll do well. God has a plan. Number two, God is working out his plan. God has a plan. God is working out his plan. And his ways are so far above our ways that we can't even fathom what's going on. Judas, the world, and the mob never understood that. We're told in the book of Romans that the same power that raised Jesus from the grave now lives in us. Imagine this. So here's my question. And this is what really kind of stood out to me as I was studying was how could those who have been so close to the king be so stinking clueless about what was going on? Jesus in John 18, for whom are you seeking? Can I tell you something this morning? This is the most important question in all eternity for every one of us. Be you a non-believer or be you a believer? That's the most important question in all eternity. Whom are you seeking? Within the question, there's another question kind of hid back there. And this is why it's the most important question for each one of us. Because within that question is this question. Who or what? Are you seeking for fulfillment in life? And let me tell you something. The answer to that question has eternal ramifications attached to it. You see, Jesus not only is the only one who gives us eternal life. He's the only one who can give your life true fulfillment. He's the only one who can give us abundant life and eternal life. And so within the question, whom are you seeking, is the question... What are you looking for? What are you trying to fill that God-shaped vacuum in your heart with? Where's the fulfillment coming in your life? The writer of Hebrews 11.6 says this. But without faith, and faith again is trusting in what God has said, leaning on him, believing in him, knowing that he's going to do what he said. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? Because the person who comes to God must, number one, believe that he is. And number two, believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently, that's dog and a bone, seek him. There it is. You must, number one, believe he is. And number two, believe he wants to reward you. 
You see, here it is. You can study, you can go to Bible college, you can get a PhD from seminary, but intellectually knowing there's a Jesus Christ and what he did will never save you from your sins. It just never will. You can study Josephus, you can study all the extra biblical history you want to, and there's no way of denying for someone who's being honest, intellectually honest, of saying that Jesus never existed. There's no way of getting around it. There's too much evidence. But intellectually knowing that there's a Jesus and intellectually knowing that we didn't come from some soup is not enough to save you. That's not enough. We need to place our faith, our trust in him and know, by the way, he will become all we need. Jesus is not only the only one who can give us eternal life, he's the only one that can make us whole. We we sang the song just a little while ago, to break every chain, to break every chain. You know, some of us in this room have had chains for decades, decades. Even if we're saved, we've kind of hung on to some of that garbage and, and we're in bondage to that garbage. And Jesus wants to break every chain, break every chain. He not only wants to give you salvation, he wants to make you spiritually whole. He wants to make you whole. So here's the questions that I'm going to end with. Do I really realize who Jesus is? The great I am, the self-existent almighty God who loves me. And by the way, remember the promise he made before he left. The promise he made before he left was, if I go, I will send my Holy Spirit to live in you. And I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So if the power that raised Jesus from the grave now lives in me, do I realize who the great I am really is? And do I want to live with that constant awareness of God's power living in me? It has the power to break every chain. It has the power to find fulfillment in life. It has the power not only to save me, but give me life. So here's my prayer. Lord, I am so thankful that you possess the greatest power in the whole wide universe. And I don't want to just intellectually know about you. I truly want to know you. I want to experience your power and the power to walk in your ways. That's what I want. When faced with a situation that is well beyond our own power, who do you go to? You know, 1-800-DR-PHIL? Or to the power who raised Jesus from the grave that now lives in you? Jesus has a plan for your life and he has promised to never leave nor forsake. And he's given us every bit of that power to break every chain in our lives. And the question is, who is the great I am? Imagine again the garden scene and these 600 soldiers walk in with clubs and swords and all this stuff. And Jesus says, whom are you seeking? And they say, Jesus. And he says, here I am. That's the power that now lives in us. How strong is the power that lives in you? And will you submit to it? And will you follow his lead? Because, again, the two things, God has a plan. And God is working out his plan. And he loves you. And we kick at the goads and we tell God we know better than him. And we probably would never say those words because we're afraid lightning would come through the building. But by our actions, we say that we know better than God. And God's so patient and merciful and kind. And instead of taking our ear off, he'll put it back on. But God, teach me your ways. Teach me to submit. Thank you for listening to Pastor Rich preach the sermon, A Grave Injustice, from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 43 through 52. 
Tune in next week as Pastor Rich preaches a topical sermon on leadership. Join us every Sunday morning, either in person at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. or at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook page. Our website is livingfaithklamath.com. To find our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram profile, simply search for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find these links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Simply click on the resources tab and then click on sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the word of God. Thank you again and God bless you.